I am Evelyn Zumaya, the author of Astral Affairs Rambova, and I want to read my book to you. Whatever happened to George Weiner? In 1930, George Weiner and Alex Rotoff still listed their addresses as the Rurich Master Building at 310 Riverside Drive. Within the next year, George's relationship with Natasha Rambova and Talbot Monday would end. Monday would not only reject George, but the entire subject of spiritualism in a dramatic reversal of personal belief. Don Allen would write that George Weiner's book, A Curious Life, was, quote, the only book she ever threw away. Despite George's relationship with Talbot Monday and Natasha Rambova being summarily terminated, he did not yet abandon his activity as medium. He would make a lasting impression on American writer, spiritualist, and political activist William Dudley Pelly. Pelly worked primarily as a journalist, but also as a Hollywood screenwriter. He wrote two of Lon Chaney's films, The Light in the Dark in 1922 and The Shock in 1923, winning two O. Henry Awards. Now, in 1929, his essay, Seven Minutes in Eternity, published in the American Magazine, brought him notoriety for his account of a near-death experience. This article put him in contact with George Weiner, who conducted many seances with Pelly. On George's encouragement, Pelly also contemplated recording the messages or revelations delivered in the seances, believing this would benefit humanity. Pelly did write extensively about George's abilities in his book titled The Dead Are Alive and included several notable seance occurrences, including his conversations with famous authors and screenwriter June Mathis. In 1933, Pelly founded the Silver Legion of America, a fascist organization which was openly anti-Semitic and racist. Pelly was so radical in his fascism, he was mentioned in Sinclair Lewis's novel, It Can't Happen Here, as a precursor to the U.S. fascist movement. In 1942, Pelly was charged with 12 counts of high treason and seditious activity and sentenced to 15 years in prison. George distanced himself from Pelly's mention and adopted several pseudonyms, including George Layton and George Haslett Weiner, perhaps in an effort to disassociate from Pelly's writings. Despite the advertisement Pelly afforded, George's mediumship with Pelly would mark the end of his career as a psychic. He turned his creative energies to his music and would do so for the remainder of his life. George composed frenetically and alleged his music was often written by White Cloud. By 1940, he and Alex were living at 156 West 56th Street near Carnegie Hall, and in May, an early version of George's piano concerto was broadcast on radio. It was then he hired, quote, a local New York City arranger, composer, copyist, and instrumentalist, Alfred Marion Harned. Harned's assignment was to write out the orchestral parts for George Weiner's Piano Concerto for 27 Instruments of a Symphony Orchestra, end quote. George's Piano Concerto would premiere on August 28, 1941, in the sculpture court of the Brooklyn Museum. Greta Lederer, former Viennese pianist, performed as soloist with the New York City Symphony Orchestra, directed by Eugene Plotnikoff, quote, among his George Weiner's performed compositions from this period were songs used in concerts by Ernestine Schumann, Heinck, and Maria Maxkovovich, ballets for Katya Sergava and Alex Rotoff, and symphonic pieces put on by the WNYC Concert Orchestra and the New York City Symphony Orchestra in 1940 and 1941. Throughout the 1940s, Weiner maintained a feverish work pace, he also began to regularly attend the Cantonese Theater of New York. Classical Chinese theater would have a profound influence on his later works for the stage, such as the opera The Mark of the King in 1961, end quote. George and Alex would later move to Brooklyn, and there George helped to found the Heights Opera Company. 
Alex continued to perform as a dancer throughout the 1940s, performing in George Balanchine's Dream with Music in 1944. With his last public mention in 1959, when he appeared on an episode of the children's television show Captain Kangaroo. George Wayner died at 79 years of age in the Long Island College Hospital in Brooklyn, living at the time at 69 Cranberry Street. It was also reported he married a longtime friend, Margreta Overbeck, an artist who designed the Colorado state flag. <phone rings> Whatever happened to Natasha Rambova? Natasha returned to New York from her recovery sale to inform Talbot Monday and Don Allen she was closing her dress shop and moving to Spain. In the course of closing out her business, she would resolve a lawsuit she filed against actress Mae Murray. Her lawsuit pending against Mae Murray alleged the actress owed $1,562 for an order which included a black coat, a black turban, a necklace, and a bracelet. According to court records, when the items were delivered to Mae Murray's home in Los Angeles, she refused to pay for them, and this instigated Natasha's lawsuit. With this lawsuit resolved in her favor, Natasha completed preparations for her move to Europe. These were expedited in no small measure by a new love interest. In a rebound from her bitter parting from Svetislav, Natasha announced she had fallen in love again, and this time on the island of Mallorca. Her new love was Spanish nobleman Alvaro de Ursaiz. Alvaro de Ursaiz was suave, dark-haired, aristocratic, and bore a striking resemblance to Rudolf Valentino. With Alvaro, Natasha wasted no time in sealing her relationship and promptly married her Spaniard twice first in a civil ceremony and then in the Church of San Francisco in Palma, Mallorca. She received the blessings of Alvaro's conservative Catholic family, assumed their surname, de Ursaiz, and received several of their priceless family heirlooms as wedding gifts. Natasha Rambova de Ursaiz would never participate in another seance, abandoning her theosophical pursuits and the occult. Her life with Alvaro in the Mediterranean villa became a pastoral and peaceful seaside existence, despite the political turmoil in Spain at the time. Natasha left her famous fashion formalities behind and was often seen makeup-free, wearing loose trousers, halter tops, and espadrilles. She was tan and happy in photos of her life during the first days with Alvaro. She and Alvaro inspired each other artistically as they launched an ambitious business of restoring villas on the island. They also undertook a complicated project of renovating a local cave system by installing lighting in the passageways. When this project was complete, they opened a small restaurant near the entrance which still stands today as Seiscoves. They also designed and built their own home high on the rocky cliffs over Mallorca's Californales. The white stucco modern villa was christened Canatasha, local Catalan dialogue for Natasha's home. Canatasha became a Mallorcan retreat for many of Natasha's New York theosophical friends, including Talbot Monday and his wife Don Allen, who visited Natasha and Alvaro in 1932. In January of 1936, Natasha and Alvaro traveled to Egypt, where they met with famed Egyptologist Howard Carter. Natasha's meeting with Carter would change the course of her life, as she would later recall, quote, I felt as if I had at last returned home. The first few days I was there, I couldn't stop the tears streaming from my eyes. It was not sadness, but some emotional impact from the past, a returning to a place once loved after too long a time, end quote. War would bring an end to Natasha's life on Mallorca as well as an end to her marriage to Alvaro. Having been too vocal with her opinions about the Spanish Civil War, Natasha's life was deemed in danger and she was advised to flee Mallorca. Secreted aboard a coal freighter, she retreated to the Chateau at Juan Le Pin, her port in every storm. On this arrival, the stress of her exodus from Mallorca and her sorrow at leaving Alvaro caused Natasha to suffer a major heart attack. 
Elvaro had visited his wife a few times at the chateau during her convalescence, before telling her he had fallen in love with another woman. He would eventually ask for an annulment of this marriage based on the grounds Natasha married him with no intention to bear children. Natasha remained in France during her recovery, traveling only for her academic pursuits. She embraced the subject of Egyptology, studying in London with famed Egyptologist S.R.K. Glanville at University College. In 1939, she returned to Manhattan to further her studies and deliver lectures on dream analysis, astrology, and demonstrate palm readings. After a brief sojourn to Arizona, she settled in New York City where she held classes in her apartment with notable New Yorkers as her students. During this academically prolific time for Natasha, she published articles and small books on subjects ranging from dream analysis, Jungian analysis, the symbolism of scarabs and cosmic circuitry and astrology to even posture and physical exercise. By the mid-1940s, Natasha applied for funding from the Bollingen Foundation, seeking a grant to launch an expedition in Egypt's Valley of the Kings, where she would study and record the symbols on scarabs. The actual focus of her fieldwork in Egypt would evolve throughout the ensuing years, but she would receive consistent Bollingen funding. With Bollingen grants, she completed a transcription of the tomb of Ramses VI, as well as a study of the four shrines of King Tutankhamun in Cairo. Natasha's Egyptological pursuits would involve the next 20 years of life. Although she would not spend all of this time in Egypt, her affiliation with renowned Egyptologist Alexander Pienkov would result in her collaborating with on the prestigious, multi-volume Egyptian religious texts and representations. Natasha would act as Pienkov's editor for The Tomb of Ramses VI as Volume 1 in 1954, The Shrines of Tutankhamun in 1955, and Mythological Papyri in 1957. She would contribute an essay to Mythological Papyri, and a fourth volume, Litany of Ray, would be dedicated to her. The most enduring and significant relationship Natasha forged throughout her Egyptological years was with epigrapher Mark Hasselriss. Natasha hired him as her epigrapher on the Valley of the Kings expedition, and he would work with her as her artist, illustrator, secretary, companion, and self-avowed disciple for the rest of her life and his. The tall, dark, and handsome Mark Hasselriss contributed in great measure to the preservation of the history of Natasha Rambova's post-Valentino legacy. When he was asked if he was in love with Natasha, he replied, quote, I wasn't, alas, it was worship of a kind, and worship can be wrong because it isn't the best kind of love, end quote. In Natasha's later years, she moved to a New England country estate in New Milford, Connecticut, where she lived a reclusive life working on her own life's comprehensive thesis, The Cosmic Circuit. Mark Hasselrus would live with her on weekends and spend much of his time with Natasha, both in New York City and in their Connecticut home. By the early 1960s, Natasha had been diagnosed with scleroderma, and the disease took its toll. She experienced increasing difficulties swallowing, with Mark Hasselrus recalling that in the last days of her life in Connecticut, Natasha ate only soft-boiled eggs and caviar. After suffering a complete collapse, she was taken to Los Angeles by her aunt and cousin, where she died on June 5, 1966, in a nursing home in Pasadena. She spent the last days of her life but a few miles from the final resting place of Rudolph Valentino in Hollywood. After her death, Mark Hasselrus would spend the rest of his life teaching and lecturing, identifying himself as Natasha Rambova's disciple. He lectured on the subjects of symbolism, Egyptology, astrology, and the chakras, using slides from the collection of Natasha Rambova as illustration. Many of his lectures were held in the grand, yet then dusty parlor of the aging Leslie Grant Scott. Natasha's ashes were strewn in a forest in Arizona, and today her artifacts and collections are housed in various institutions, including Yale University, the Utah Museum of Fine Arts, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, 
and the Phoenix Art Museum. Whatever happened to What Price Beauty? As Rudolph Valentino's executor, George Ullman endeavored to distribute Natasha's film What Price Beauty after the star's death as the movie was an asset of the Rudolph Valentino Production Company. Ullman first sought a contract for its distribution with United Artists President Joe Schenck. After a few test showings, Schenck informed George he had no interest in the film. George then went to the Pathé Company where he negotiated a contract for their worldwide distribution of the film. In the Exhibitor's Trade Review, August 1925, it is reported Natasha and Ullman were in New York to arrange a release of the movie. But it would not be until 1928 that the film would be shown publicly. Pathé released the film to a limited audience with notices appearing in trade publications. The film's producer is cited as S. George Ullman, with its release date as January 28, 1928, and the final length of the film as 4,000 feet. With meager audience interest in the film, Pathé dropped the project. This left George Ullman fighting unsuccessfully for Pathé's return of the film's original negative. He was finally informed the negative had been destroyed. Natasha's movie What Price Beauty is a lost film and exists today as movie stills, articles, and advertisement. Whatever happened to RTM Scott? RTM Scott would achieve more success in 1935 when his action novel The Spider was produced as a popular weekly radio show. His son, RTM Scott Jr., followed in his father's literary footsteps by working at popular publications. He was acting editor of the True Mystic magazine in November 1938, and it was R.T.M. Jr. who published George Wainer's article, The Valentino Death Prophecy. In the February 17, 18, and 19, 1931 issues of the Hearst Press Syndicate, three notable articles by R.T.M. Scott were featured. These articles seem to authenticate the ability to communicate with the astral or Mahatma Rudolph Valentino. Scott, then chairman of the New York Division of the American Society for Psychic Research, wrote the articles as an account of how actress Ruth Rowland conversed with Valentino during a seance conducted by George Wehner. She presented a series of questions and believed she received her answers from the discarnate Rudy. RTM Scott Jr., was killed during World War II, and his father would pass away in 1966 in New York at the age of 83. Whatever happened to Leslie Grant Scott? Leslie Grant Scott would author one publication, Dying as a Liberation of Consciousness, published in 1931 in the Journal for the American Society for Psychic Research. She outlived her husband, RTM, and resided in their opulent home in New York, the rest of her life. Mark Hasselrus befriended Leslie and wrote that she analyzed dreams as a, quote, enthusiastic Jungian who also gave Rorschach tests. Hasselrus would deliver a series of lectures in her parlor in the early 1970s. Leslie Scott's actual date of death is unknown, but as Mark Hasselrus visited her some years after RTM's death in 1966, it is assumed she lived into the 1970s and well into her 80s. Whatever happened to Talbot Mundy? Talbot Mundy would renounce all interest in the occult and sell the rights to some of his more popular books to movie studios, including his best-selling novels, The Winds of the World and King of Kyber Rifles. Mundy wrote 47 novels, 130 novelettes, or short stories, and 23 non-fiction articles which were published in magazines such as Adventure, Cavalier, and Argosy. He married five times, with Don Allen being his fifth wife. His biographer Brian Taves states Monday was, quote, engaged in a lifelong discourse on philosophy and religion, including Eastern ideas on subjects like karma and reincarnation, which would later be popularized by the New Age movement, end quote. His body of work survives to enjoy continued appreciation. Talbot Mundy died in August 1940 at 61 years of age. 
Whatever happened to Svetislav Rurich? Svetislav Rurich lived the remainder of his life in India, recognized as a celebrated artist. In 1936-1937, a first exhibition of his art was held at the State Exhibition of the United Provinces and Look Now. Continuous exhibitions of his work were organized, and in 1941, Svetislav was commissioned to paint the first of several official portraits he would complete of India's Prime Minister, Nehru. In 1945, he married Indian film star Devika Rani Choudhury, known as Devika Rani. At the time, she was acting administrator of the film studio Bombay Talkies. After their marriage, Svetislav and Devika lived outside of Bangalore on a large estate they christened Tataguni. In addition to collecting local folk items and studying flora, Svetislav continued to be a prolific artist, with his paintings being showcased throughout India, Europe, and Russia. In 1960, a comprehensive retrospective of his work was held in Delhi. That same year, Svetislav returned to Russia, for an exhibition of his art in the State Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts in Moscow. Svetislav Rich died at the age of 88 in 1993 and is buried on his estate in Bangalore. Whatever happened to Alice Bailey? Alice Bailey and her husband Foster Bailey founded the Lucius Trust in 1922, which is still in existence. The primary activity of the Lucius Trust is the promotion and management of the Arcane School. Alice and Foster Bailey also established a publishing company to publish Alice's books. She died in 1949 at 69 years of age. Whatever happened to Aunt Teresa Warner? Aunt Teresa lived the remainder of her life in Los Angeles. At the request of Valentino's estate executor, George Ullman, she would returned to Los Angeles in November of 1926 to guard her interests in Valentino's estate. Teresa Warner would pass away at 76 years of age in 1941. Whatever happened to Muzzy Hudna? Before the German invasion of France in 1939, Muzzy received warning of the Nazi advance while at the Chateau. She acted quickly by having her collection of antiques and treasures crated and shipped to New York. Upon her return to New York, and throughout the 1940s, she bequeathed her entire collection to the University of Utah. The contribution was extensive, and in order to accommodate the tapestries, oil paintings, Louis XVI furniture, artifacts, and jewelry, the university dedicated a floor and a campus building as the Hudnut Gallery, which opened on May 6, 1951. The collection has since been relocated and is now housed in the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. Muzzy died in September of 1957. Whatever happened to George Wainer's monkey? George Wainer's monkey appears to have survived at least two years in Manhattan. A photograph of Talbot Mundy holding the monkey reveals the little beast was doing well when Monday arrived in New York in the summer of 1928.